a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, he ascended on high and took prisoners captive. He gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? The one who descended is also the one who ascended, far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles, others as prophets, others as evangelists, others as pastors and teachers, to equip the holy ones for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith and knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the extent of the full stature of Christ, so that we may no longer be infants, tossed by waves and swept along by every wind of teaching arising from human trickery, from their cunning in the interests of deceitful scheming. Rather, living the truth in love, we should grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, with the proper functioning of each part, brings about the body's growth and builds itself up in love. Urbum Domini, Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. I rejoiced because they said to me, we will go up to the house of the Lord. And now we have set foot within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city with compact unity, to it the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. According to the decree of, for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. In it are set up judgment seats, seats for the house of David. Sancti Evangelii secundum Lucam. Gloria Some people told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with the blood of their sacrifices. He said to them in reply, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were greater sinners than all other Galileans? By no means. But I tell you, if you do not repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 people who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than everyone else who lived in Jerusalem? By no means. But I tell you, if you do not repent, you will all perish as they did. 
And he told them this parable. There once was a person who had a fig tree planted in his orchard. And when he came in search of fruit on it but found none, he said to the gardener, for three years now I have come in search of fruit on this fig tree but have found none, so cut it down. Why should it exhaust the soil? He said to him in reply, Sir, leave it for this year also, and I shall cultivate the ground around it and fertilize it. It may bear fruit in the future. If not, you can cut it down. Verbum Domini. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the readings of today, who are just your ordinary readings, or just ordinary, readings are never just ordinary, are exactly also applicable to the saint of today, Jim Paul II, by many of us called Jim Paul II the Great. Because in the first reading he says, and he gave some as apostles, others as prophets, others as evangelists, others as pastors and teachers, to equip the holy ones for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, and so on and so on. Now, this is just him, isn't he? He has been given these gifts to be our Holy Father, a wonderful Father for his flock. And secondly, Jesus is taught about justice, and he says, no, everyone needs justice, but then at once behind, after the first part of the gospel we hear about this fig tree that did not bring fruit in its time. No, wait, wait, wait another year, wait another year. I shall cultivate the ground around it and fertilize it. It may bear fruit in the future. If you can, if not, you can cut it down. So this mercy, give them another time, another chance, another opportunity. Just be patient with people. That was he too. He was the prophet the Apostle of Mercy, as we all know. Born in Poland, Wadowice in 1920, John Paul II was the first non-Italian Pope since the Dutch Pope, Adrian VI, who served from 1522 to 1523. He was elected by the second papal conclave in 1978, you know, the year of the two popes, which was called after Pope John Paul I, who had been elected in August, after the death of Pope Paul VI. But he died, as we all know, after 33 days, this smiling Pope. Car Cardinal Wartiwa was elected on the third day of the conclave and adopted his predecessor's name to tribute to him. He was the second longest serving Pope, John Paul II, in modern history, from 1978 to 2005. 26 years, almost 27 years old, after Pope Pius IX, who served for nearly 32 years in the 19th century. If we look at the outside, he was one of the most traveled world leaders in history. He first went to Mexico, as you all know, to Guadalupe, to pay tribute to Mary in her biggest pilgrim plates. But after that, visiting another 128 countries, traveling more than 1,100,000 that sounds better than 680,000 miles <clears throat> during his pontificate. Very freely, but always positively, and in the language of human dignity, he addressed the very sensitive issues in the face of everyone, political leaders, church leaders. He was just straightforward every time, but with a sense of humor and a great sense of truth and sincerity, and of a great cultivation as you know, he studied literature before he went to seminary. He had a language to not offend the communists in Poland, but still say the truth. It was a wonderful combination of sensitivity and strength. As part of this special emphasis on the universal call to holiness, he beatified and canonized 483 saints, 
more than the combined tally of his predecessors during the preceding five centuries. He wrote many encyclicals in which he put Christ and his redeeming power at the center, meditated on the Eucharist, defended the family, staunchly defended the dignity of human life from the beginning to the end, explained the meaning of suffering and the existence of intrinsically evil deeds that cannot be ordered at God. And he developed the social teaching of the church, looked at the relation between faith and reason, and so on and so on. He was very much aware of the importance of crossing the threshold of the third millennium, prepared it very well in its, the three years before it with paying attention to the Holy Trinity, a year of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and had a wonderful text written, Novo Millennium in Iunte, a must read still, I would say, <clears throat> still very inspiring. By the time of his death, he had named most of the College of Cardinals, consecrated or co-consecrated a large number of the world's bishops and ordained many priests. And of course, a key goal of his papacy was to transform and reposition the Catholic Church in the world. His wish was also to place his church at the heart of a new religious alliance that would bring Jews, Muslims, Christians in a great religious armada for peace. For that reason, he also had his prayer meetings in Assisi, where he showed an example of inner possibilities of every religion to work with priests with, on peace. And I was present at his funeral, by accident almost, and there you saw the whole political world for so many countries. The religious and the secular leaders were together there, hundreds of them, to pray tribute to this great guy, great pope, who worked so much for peace and freedom in the whole of the world. He has a great legacy for the world. The fall of communism was partly at least contributing attributed by him. He significantly improved the Catholic Church's relations with the religions, Judaism, Islam, Eastern Orthodox Churches, Anglican Communion. He installed, he started with the World Youth Days. I had the privilege to be at the first one, and now I've already participated in 10, and they're still inspiring. Mercy Sunday, he is proclaimed. He issued the Catechism of the Catholic Church, a new code of the canon law. He had a wonderful series of general audiences on the theology of the body, later published in a wonderful book. And of course, especially his personal example of holiness while praying, while preaching. And I would like to just mention two little experiences I had as a young priest, especially with him. I experienced him in Rome for the first time live on the St. Peter's Place, and I was so much uh, taken aback by his way of speaking. Every word had, had its own charge. Of course, that was because he practiced maybe some theater in the beginning, but it was more than theater. You, you felt he thought about every word he said. Everything, what he said, got a deep meaning. And that was, of course, also because of his inspiration by the underground theater group in Poland he attended to and he participated in during the communist and the later Nazist uh, occupation, but still it was in his own heart. And secondly, in this, in this preaching he also talked to the young people with, in a way I'd never experienced before from popes. He addressed them very personally. I say, you are the future of the church. Of course, you are also the present day church, but you are the future. I put my trust in you and I challenge you. So he brought people to their best. He really lived the dignity. Of course, he studied Scheler with a great attention, Max Scheler, with great attention to human dignity, but he personalized that. And he wasn't afraid to ask people the hardest and the greatest things so that they may be fully flourishing Wonderful. That's, that's one. His talk was just really touching. And also, for instance, when he talked about Humanae Vitae, of course, Pope Paul VI was a little yeah, anxious after there were lots of waves of critiques on Humanae Vitae, which is a wonderful document. Even Pope, the Pope today also tells many times it's a prophetic document. Wonderful. And Paul VI was taken back. Maybe he was a little careful talking about it. But this John Paul II, he talked about it with such a f flavor and such a courage and such a 
Self-evidence, oh, you can talk about that like that too. So don't be afraid to talk about Humanae Vitae, dear Catholics. He did it too. And just live it up, live up to it, of course, too. It's more important even. To the young, he spoke with such a young spirit and challenging, giving them great trust and confidence. So this is about his speaking, but then I saw something. I'm not a clear-voyant people person, but you know, at the preparation of the Mass in Castel Gandolfo, I could participate and could celebrate in this Mass. He served for our group of young people who visited him. I saw him dressing up, and it was as if at least 20 centimeters out of his body irradiated some aura, some white, huge white aura. I'd, I'd never see auras or whatever, but I don't even know whether they exist, but still, um, it was as if he, he was already a saint. Of course, you have to be saint in order to be proclaimed, proclaimed a saint, but, but he looked like one at that time. Um, yeah, really something. This is all the outside, dear friends in Christ. But what is this inside? Where does it all come from? Of course, you've got many talents, a great memory, a great sense of humor, a great mind to think about things, a great strong body, he's sportive. But in his heart, he was a mystic too, I think. He was deeply touched by his early mentor, Jan Tiranovsky, with his group of the Living Rosary, who installed in him a deep longing for mystic contemplation. And it was because of this man that his doctoral dissertation at the Angelicum in Rome was an expression of his great love for St. John of the Cross, whose faith he studied in this dissertation. He honored very much because he felt this merciful love, like the present Pope, is very much touched by the mercy of God. He honored Sister Faustina Kowalska very much by stressing at many times God's merciful love and by canonizing her promoting the spreading and veneration of the image of the merciful Jesus and the other devotions, one of which we will say after Mass, that she received, like the Chaplet of Mercy and the Sunday of Mercy, like the Gospel of today, the mercy of Christ. And of course, who can forget that, his love for Mary, in the way of Saint Marie Grignon de Montfort, with a total dedication. His mother was totus tuus, totally yours, and he lived that. And he attributed his survival on the May 13th, 1981, when he was shot to Mary of Fatima. He had a suffering life at the end of his life, you know, he had Parkinson, he deteriorated physically, but his mind remained very strong. And the last image I got was on television. He showed up for the last time at this window at the St. Peter's Square, his study, and he tried to give a blessing, and you saw him wrestle with his own body to, to raise his hand. But you saw irradiate the willpower. But his body, yeah, he did, doesn't really work with it. But he got his hand up and he blessed us all the whole world again. And I thought at that moment, wow, once he got rid of his body, what will he do in heaven there? <laughs> he will bring the whole heaven in movement and he will be a great intercessor. It's just great. And you know, he did some miracles, so we, we could call him a saint now. But I experienced in our diocese too, we have a prayer group, and they invited the man with Parkinson to pray to John Paul II, and he was healed. The doctors couldn't believe what they saw, and he was just put out of order for the working force. He got a kind of stipend from the state because he couldn't work anymore, but he had to go back to the state and say, I can work again, and they didn't believe it. So he's still working, and I would invite everyone to pray to him on his intercession, I think he's still working in the world with his power, with his love, with his mercy. Let us trust in him, but through him, of course, in Christ, who was his great inspiration, who, whom he lived for all of his life, and whom we can follow too. Amen. <laughs>